Let us pray. Compassionate God, triune God of love, be our hope, be our refuge and our protection. Amen. I was born uh, in the north of England, in Harrogate, a town which was recently voted the poshest town in northern England. Poshest town in northern England. Yet there are those who remember Harrogate in the 1950s and before who reckon it's truly posh days are history now. If they're right, it doesn't say much for other so-called posh places in the north of England these days. But I recall, as a boy in the late 50s and early 60s, often seeing posh cars in my town. Rollers, Daimlers, Bentleys, Jaguars, among others. And while we could never afford a car like that, I took it for granted because you just assume that you grow up in a place that's just like where everyone else grows up. I took it for granted that you'd see such cars wherever you went. That it was normal to have people who drove Daimlers and Bentleys in your town or whose chauffeur drove the Daimler. Well, Philippi was a posh town too. It's been said Philippi was a centre for the imperial cult, a retirement community for veterans of the Roman army, and a city saturated in social hierarchies. I certainly grew up in a place saturated in social hierarchies. So I really resonate with that phrase because when you grow up in a posh town, you are conscious of your place. You know where you belong. You absorb it without even thinking, trying. You just, it just becomes part of you. Philippian Christians knew where they belonged and they imagined they knew where Christ belonged. He was top dog, a.k.a. Lord of heaven and earth. His was the name above all names. So it might have surprised the average Philippian Christian to hear Paul say that having the same mind among you as Christ Jesus means being humble. The mind of Christ is a humble mind, looking to the interests of others, emptying yourself, being prepared to lose your life, even at that time, perhaps to lose it on a cross. Let's not forget that Paul wrote this letter from prison a jailbird who didn't know if he were going to be condemned or released. We don't go to jail for our faith in Australia, but we still have to die to ourselves. Paul spells that out as chapter 2 of Philippians begins. If then there is any comfort in Christ, any consolation from love, any partnership in the Spirit, any tender affection and sympathy, if there's any of this wonderful reality in Christ, Paul says, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind and having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others.
let this same mind be among you that was in Christ Jesus. This wasn't the message the posh, powerful people of Philippi were used to hearing. They were proud. They knew what it meant to have authority, at least they did if they weren't slaves, children, or women. If they weren't any of these, in any of these categories, they could exercise, in other words, if they were a, a citizen who was a male, let's, let's be clear, uh, they could exercise unquestioned authority. Someone's got to be on top of the heap and someone's got to be on the bottom of the heap in places like Philippi or Harrogate, haven't they? I mean, that's just the way things are. In Paul's time, it was clear who was right at the bottom of the heap, at the very bottom. It was those despised, repellent people who suffered the accursed death of crucifixion. Yet, that's just where Paul locates Jesus. Just where Paul locates Jesus. With lowest of the low, with the most contemptible of the dregs of humanity. And Paul presents Jesus to the posh, powerful people of Philippi as an example to follow. An example of humility, of self-giving, of serving others. Paul says that's where there is true life, eternal life, life right now. Who could have guessed? Who could have guessed without it being shown to us by Jesus Christ? The absolute miracle is some of them heard and accepted Paul's message. They heard of the love of Jesus Christ that took him to the cross and found an answering love being kindled from deep within. They experienced a new desire, a desire to follow the Lord that they had been introduced to. Now, Paul goes on then to quote a hymn to express his feelings, his joy. Sometimes only a hymn can express our deepest feelings, you know? You know that? When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's love? Love divine or love's excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down. Paul drew on the words of a hymn that would have been known by the Philippian Christians. It might not have sounded like a hymn to us, it might have sounded more like a chant. But it was known, and Paul was quoting it. And the first words of this hymn are, Though he existed in the form of God, he did not, require, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, assuming human likeness. And just as if when I quoted the first words of some of those other hymns, you started to hear them in your mind. The Philippians would have heard this hymn, this chant in their minds as they uh, read it uh, in Paul's letter. Now I'm not sure what the retired soldiers of uh, Philippi and the devotees of the cult of emperor worship thought of this. They had been formed as people who applauded success, victory, the accumulation of honour and wealth. They issued orders. It was slaves who served. Paul was proclaiming a loser. Worse than that, a Jewish loser who died on a cross. But surely this was only for a little while. When Christ was in the form of God at the beginning, surely he was glorious to behold. And now, risen from the dead, surely glorious once more, given the name above all names. 
It's only in between that he humbled himself, surely. Are we so sure? Are we so sure? The hymn we sang at the start of the service certainly suggests that. Humbled for a season to receive a name from the lips of sinners unto whom he came. The scandal of the cross is implied in this uh, great hymn, but it's not spelled out. And that would be okay, but it seems to me that the passage that the hymn is based on requires a little more uh, about the cross to be a truly, truly, truly great hymn. But there's a still more serious question that I'd like to explore with you. It's about the way most Bible translations render Paul's Greek into English. Paul wrote in Greek, we read in English, someone's got to translate it for us. In the NRSV that we use, verses 6 and 7 say, who, though he existed in the form of God, did not require equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. Well, let's look at those words again, and we'll stay on this slide for now. Who, though he existed in the form of God, did not require equality, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped. That's what the NRSV says. What if, though, we read it as something like, who, existing in the form of God, did not require equality with God as something to be grasped? Can you see what I've done? I've removed the word, though. Why change the words of Scripture? Well, the thing is, every translation is an interpretation. Every translation is an effort to put the words of one language and shoehorn them, shoehorn them into another language and they don't always fit exactly. And the NRSV is no exception. Most translations, not just the NRSV, insert a word like though in there. Though he was in the form of God. But there is no though in the original Greek. Paul didn't write though. It's more accurate, I'd suggest, to read it the second way. Who, existing in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped. Or even because he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped. It's part of God's godness that God is humble, that God's love reaches out, that God's being wants to be shared with the creatures that God has made. So it's precisely because Christ existed in the form of God, that he showed himself to be humble and self-giving, loving and ready to serve. Not though he was in the form of God, because God doesn't do those things, but because he was in the form of God. God is not a self-important dictator or a micromanager. God is Love, self-giving, eternally radiating love. So when God exalted Christ even more highly and gave him the name above every other name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue could, should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, then exalted Christ remains true to himself. He doesn't let it go to his head. He doesn't put on airs and graces. And he's not at all posh. He reigns today by giving. 
and serving. So, let this mind be among you that was in Christ Jesus. The mind he actually lived and showed and embodied. Amen.